Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everyone. Happy Sunday. So if you are watching me from Facebook, thank you so much. Hey, Facebook, if you are watching me from the group, Witch Slayers, hey, Witch Slayers. And if you're watching me from YouTube, hey, YouTube, how's everyone doing? So if you guys do not know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, okay? So I wanted to do my part and make sure that we touch on mental health. Your mental health is very important. And so today I have a guest. She is a therapist and she's going to talk to you guys about depression, anxiety, grief, any questions that you may have, she is here to answer any questions you may have. Sometimes people shy away from therapists, but let me tell you, I'm a firm believer in therapists. I am in therapy now, and I think that it's doing a great deal of work for me, and I am working on my healing. So I want you also to work on your healing and work on your mental health because, again, it is very important. So without further ado, I want to introduce her name is Lovely Poole. Hi, Lovely. How are you? Hi, Shay. How you doing? How you doing? doing? Good and good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, yeah, I'm so I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited that Shay has given me this opportunity to um, speak with you all. Just be on this platform. Um, I'm excited. I don't know if you're gonna notice, but this is one of my first times <laughs> doing something like this. But um, you know, I um, jumped to an opportunity to answer any questions um, you know that you all may have, and to point you in that right direction to get any help that you are seeking. Um, and mental health. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Like she said, my name's Lovely Pool. I am a, a, a LMSW, which is a licensed medical social work worker. So licensed mental health professional in the state of Arizona. Um, a little background about my step myself. I'm from um, Youngstown, Ohio. I don't know if you all are familiar with it, but that's what I'm originally from. Um, after undergrad, I went to Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, got my master's degree. And um, from there, that's the yeah, I met my husband in the AUC. From there, I took the long journey West Coast to Arizona. Been here for about 15 years. Has been a wonderful journey. Throughout the journey, um, I started... Um, I guess I would say boots on the ground in the field. I really wanted to learn this system, the behavior health field out here in Arizona. And I've had a, a wonderful process and journey along the way, um, um, kind of grasping the, you know, the culture, what's going on. And I don't know if you all are from Arizona, but just a little background, uh, Arizona has a huge um, support for those who are, who have serious mental illness all the way from general mental health to serious mental illnesses. So, um, they're a large support. So I jumped like dove right in, started off working, um, in case management. And then I went straight to working with, um, juvenile justice, doing drug court, um, working with those who, uh, to help reduce recidivism through drug court. Um, I work with those youth in schools with behavioral issues. Um, I have a background being a, a school clinician, kind of working on um, functional behavior analysis, behave, behavior um, uh, modifications, be, behavior intervention plans. Those who, those of you who work in schools are familiar with FBA and BIPs. Uh, what we call them, it's an acronym for everything. So if I throw out an acronym you do not know, don't hesitate to uh, put it in the chat or comments and I'll make sure to let you know what it means. So yes, worked just in this extensive field working in from those from those areas. I've gotten into I went into private practice, working with those with general mental health um, who are suffering from anxiety and depression. Um, one of my positions was grant funded. I work with those who were victims of crimes, a VOCA grant. Um, so those who have been sex trafficked, those who have been victimized, um, and they were. Um, typically a part of the homeless population. So work with them on their mental health issues also um, to help get that ha housing and that um, sustainability, you know, just get, you know, sustainability with, with all the trauma they've suffered. Um, worked in residential settings um, as a residential therapist therapist for children um, at an all girls home, um, 11 to 17 
through, um, and I've also worked on, um, worked with a seriously mentally, seriously mentally ill population, the SMI population out here, those who were in residential settings, um, provided counseling, and I was a clinical director. Um, yes. And then my journey took me through, through referrals and people, you know, like, Hey, I think you will love this person. Uh, you might want to do this. I went into medical, medical realm as well. So went into medical social work and, um, worked home, home health and hospice as a medical social worker before circling back to, mental health. I have my own private practice. I also do, I'm a clinical director over a nonprofit out here. Um, it's called Ebony House out here. Give a shout out. And so that's what I'm doing now um, in this field and the journey, knowing that our families, what I love about my journey is it took a part of everyone. So I've went from children all the way to grandparents and geriatrics to kind of see the holistic um, effects of how mental health can affect the family. So it has just broadened, you know, my experience to be more, I don't know. I don't know how you could put it, just kind of attuned to people's needs. So that's kind of a little bit about me. Oh, can't hear you, Shay. Okay, I, I had I was muted. Okay, <laughs> so there you go. So much, lovely. Um, mm -hmm. you, you've done a whole lot. Okay, yeah. you've done a whole lot. So, um, we're gonna take any questions that you guys may have. Please leave them down in the comments. I'm gonna be mm -hmm. checking. Um, and if you want to ask the therapist, like I said in the title, um, no, no one's happy every day. And so, no. um, lovely, I would love for you to, to touch on. Mm -hmm. um, so what will be the best advice that you'll give someone that is going through um, anxiety mm -hmm. or depression at this time? Okay. So what it is, is the thing about it is with anxiety and, and depression, well, first and foremost, I want to say if it's a serious, urgent, imminent need, like for sure, I am not like, you know, 911, go to the hospital, you know, safety first to make sure if it's mm -hmm. like, I say imminent, but if it's an emergency, need, but when people but going into it like people experience mental health differently so people have different ways that they experience sadness and worries um but when those feelings don't go away that's when it's time to seek help um a lot of times um we try to muscle our way through depression and anxiety like i could do it right oh i'm a strong black woman right overwhelmed overwhelmed and being a woman that don't go hand in hand i could do this all i got to do is get some rest all i have to do is go through my family like go 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 talk to my pastor or go talk to someone about my issue but we're when we're really not talking to them we're telling them surface so that's why when you notice that it's overwhelming you're in bed a little bit longer than usual if you notice your emotions are off like you're yelling at someone screaming or you're crying or you don't know like it's kind of uncontrollable that could be a time to seek help it's not always your hormones i hear people like who my hormones i don't know why i'm crying yes for sure rule out medical but it could be um something dealing with your mental health something that's on your chest something that you may need to get out so um Sometimes you just need someone to help you sort out things. So that's a big part of what I do. I kind of help get to the bottom of the underlying needs, kind of help them sort out. Uh, most people find, most people know what's going on, but it's kind of like you need that validation. And then you need the strategies to kind of help you overcome uh, some of the things that you need to cope with, some of the negative feelings that you're feeling. So yeah, so anything could do anything could be like that did i see someone say they had they struggle with depression yes someone okay. said i have a problem with with stress and depression mm -hmm. okay okay so that's part. okay stress and depression stress anxiety depression i always say go hand in hand the biggest tip that I usually um, give people when I'm working on stress management is what I like. Now, multiple things you could do to work on stress ma management. Stress is like a warning sign uh, mm -hmm. to something, right? So stress um, can, like when you have stress, you have to figure out a way to overcome it. So I don't want you to think that certain 
feelings are just negative and you shouldn't have them. No, we're going to have them. But look at it as a warning sign. You got to be careful with stress because stress can cause, okay, strokes. Uh, you know, you it can increase your blood pressure, which could lead, you know, could lead to stroke, heart attack, different things like that. So when you get that stress feeling, the headaches, that's when you like, okay, what's going on? So a headache, how have I eating? How's my blood pressure? Okay, I'm still having this thing. Okay, what's going on? So this is when you have to rule out different things that's going on in your life. I always tell people a big key to it is not putting all your eggs in one basket. So with stress management, when I say all your eggs in one basket, what I tell um, some of my clients and, and, and some of the people within my ministry, what I say is, okay, you need to have different outlets throughout the day. If, if family is the only thing you focus on, some happens with family, you're going to be stressed. It's going to be hard to come out of it. You're not going to have any friends to lean on. You don't got a job to go through. You don't got anything else. So all your eggs in one basket is, okay, make sure you have family, make sure you have friends outlet. You got to have a self-care. It's good to have a job. If you don't have a job, have a hobby, have some different things going on because if something happens in one of your areas, you can always go to your hobby or what you do for self-care to kind of mm -hmm. calm you down. So that way you can focus a little more on that area that's causing stress. So that's a tip that I kind of give with people who are dealing with stress. Um, and also, too, like I said, like medical, always get the medical stuff done first. Um, trying to look at it. Um, always get the medical stuff done first to rule it out because it could be a certain medication that needs adjusting. It could be um, something going on with your blood pressure, hormones, anything. And then you may feel better because sometimes medical symptoms and mental health <laughs> symptoms can go hand in hand. You can rule that out and you could feel a lot better. And you would have thought you were having anxiety or depression. So this one says tips for managing mental, ment physical stress and mental stress. When I get overworked too much, I tend to either get more frustrated, which turns into less sleep. OK, yes, yes. So, yes. OK. <laughs> A part of it. Um, OK, so there's no replacement for sleep. I always tell people um there's no replacement for sleep because sleep is like our, our reset. Um, it's been a couple, it's a little research, research that has been coming out about how, you know, if you just get more sleep and you can feel a lot better, but I know when you're a busy body or you're always on the go and I'm like that, I'm pretty sure Shay is like that. Sometimes we're always working, working, working. So we're not realizing we need to sleep. So a big thing for um, managing that exercise if you can figure out 30 minutes of your day whether it's to walk to the mailbox and back a couple times or walk around the cul-de-sac or even around your apartment whatever it is to kind of wear some of that energy out a lot of my um clients when they suffer from sleep like insomnia if it, uh, some people do get medications but if they don't want to go towards medication i tell them sometimes you have to sit in the bed cut out your lights and they're like no i don't i don't you know i i has my mind is still racing i gotta have a tv on or some lights i said if you have a tv on youtube has the the different sounds like the rain i know some people like i don't want to do the water but they got fireplaces they got that background noise to kind of or soothing or they have mindfulness like meditation that could kind of soothe you to the way of sleep versus the distractions because sometimes we need to kind of sit down be still calm our body down in order for us to fall asleep because our rest alone will be good and as far as the stress management, you know, like you have to identify where, where is it coming from? And typically it's family or if it's work or if it's friends, what, what is it about work that's causing you stress? Is it you don't have good time management? You're not figuring out the schedule. You're always behind. For some reason, you can't get to your work. So if it's time management, you set what I tell people, you set like a 30, okay, instead of trying to do something for two hour time slots do like a 15 minute and then take up get up walk around come back do like another 30 minutes so that way you get your work done in chunks versus trying to sit for two hours and you find out the last 
30 minutes of the two hours, you're just now getting started. So you got to kind of break it up where that way it can still, you can still get the work done, but it doesn't seem as overwhelming, but that's if it's time management at work. So you got to kind of figure out, that's why a mental health professional comes in because as you're talking, they're taking notes and they're like, Oh, that's what it is about work. Okay. If it's a peer relationship or a, a, a coworker relationship, they give you strategies to kind of handle those interpersonal relationships you might have. So, you know, so that's why it's kind of good. But yes, that's one of the things that you have to work on. Did I see another questions come across? I'm hoping I answered the questions. Uh, yeah, I think um, someone just yeah. said, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Because it's like, so I, thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. No, go, go for ahead, it. Love no, I was no, going to say, say, along with the getting rest, moving around more can help you get the rest, but you got to eat well. Eating well helps, and you got to connect to different people. So it's it's multiple mm -hmm. things that you can do to kind of, you know, and also the biggest key is to kind of know your limits. Like, we kind of go over our limits, and your body will tell you with those warning signs, like I said, the headaches, the the heart like you know numbness anything your body will tell you like you kind of reaching your limits so i'm gonna have to calm down take you know the deep breaths like you know you feel it we have to stop when we feel it a lot of people keep going through it and that's what exacerbates things so know your <laughs> limit but go for it i didn't see the other one chronic illness living with sickle cell disease a vascular crying spells post betrayal syndrome wasting my okay practice tons of face self care and exercising and keep slipping keep slipping seems like you're doing it's it's tough with the with the comorbidities because we, okay so when you're I, and I can imagine about the the going to the hospital back and forth, just trying to get the medication correct with that. Um, I would just recommend, like, you got to keep in touch. Like, your doctor, your your PCP, and a therapist would be your best friend working working together. You know, working together. I'm not sure with your with your med with your medical conditions. I'm not sure if it's if it's any. Um, I'm not sure if it's any psychotropic medications that can help because um, I, I, I'm guessing you're probably triggered a lot and just with the racing mind. So the tons of faith, I would say, yes, yes, ma'am. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, I do tons of faith as well. So, I mean, when I go to church, you know, just get that reset. So practice tons of faith, self-care, exercising. Um, and then the, the, that racing mind is really tough. So mindfulness meditation, like the meditation and different grounding techniques ha helps with the, the racing mind. Um, also, like uh, when we notice that we're going and we're all over the place, sometimes when I say grounding tech techniques, it's like you're sitting still, you're in a moment, you're present and you're and you're kind of looking for different distractions or you're just trying to be in a moment. So it's like five things that you see, four things you hear. What can you feel? What can you, you know, things like that to kind of help that racing minds to kind of get into the moment to kind of get you right to what you need to focus on. Once you see that your mind is clear, and again, therapists can give you these strategies in more detail, but once you see your mind is clear, then you could go moving towards for focusing on the next steps um, with the with the chronic illnesses and comorbidities is very good to always ask your doctor because it is going to be limits to things that you can do. Um, but if you feel like exercising and it's good and they say it's okay, just like I said, know your limits, but also that racing mind. And it's always good to have a, 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 psycho, a, a therapist to kind of help you vent, to kind of talk through um talk through what's going on with you medically, kind of goal plan, goal set, like talk about what you want, next steps, and what you're kind of going through with the different health appointments and the doctor's appointments and stuff like that. So, um, and someone who's faith-based, they do have faith-based counselors too who work with people. So who could keep in the line to what your beliefs are? All right. I hope that answered your question. When I taught for 26 years before stopping working, I didn't realize how stressed I was until I would come home and just sit in the dark and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ignored it because I'm such a strong person. Oh, my gosh. I You know, I had to take some notes on this because I said, make sure to touch on this. And you hit the nail on the hair, right? So... <laughs> Make mental health a priority. We have to make our mental health a priority. Part of the challenge is 
of getting care is our cultural beliefs. So even though you see yourself as a strong person, I don't know, you might've grew up from where I grew up from because everybody said, you need to be strong. You need to do this. Women are strong, strong black women, you know? So it's always that. So it's, it's, it's tough sometimes to feel like you can't do something. And then it's like only the people who are crazy or weak see mental health professionals. So it's like, we find, we constantly see ourselves, uh, just going going down a downward spike, spiral until we can't go anymore. And even when we sometimes go to our elders or the people in our community, they, they're telling us like, oh, I went through that. You'll be all right. Because it's not those discussions mm -hmm. that are had within our community um, or we're throwing out or we're throwing out, oh, they're just, they're all right. It's nothing wrong with them. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, well, cousin Thomas, he's yelling and screaming and keep touching his ear. Oh, he's all right. Nothing wrong with him. He just need to go get some rest. So these were the things, the cultural things that we went through back in the day. And I'll be honest, I'm like, okay, that's not the baby. Why are we calling him the baby? Grown man, like he be put some clothes. Well, he just, he the baby and he going to the back and no one ever addressed these mental health symptoms. And we're like, okay or either this is what i hear sometimes not wrong with them they know better when they want to know better i said do you know how much effort you have to put into acting like you're having psychosis every day or you're you can't regulate your emotions every day so it has to be something wrong whether they know better and they faking somebody who want to fake that bad is still something wrong right so i have to constantly break these things down so we have to it's like we're so busy taking care of ourselves, taking care of our kids, taking care of our parents, take care of the people at work. We never take the step back to take care of ourselves until like we crash and we in that fetal position <laughs> in mm -hmm. the bed. So we're like, oh my gosh, what have I do? So we mm -hmm. have to be reminded to attending to our own needs. That's the physical, that's the emotional. We have to tend to our own needs. And then it makes us better able to care for our loved ones when we do so. So you can't ignore yourself. You still are strong, even when you need help. Um, you know, we've all gone through times when we needed somebody. We haven't gotten here on our own, asked our parents or whoever our guardians or whoever changed our, uh, <laughs> whoever changed our diapers when we were little. We couldn't get to where we are on our own on our own and we, but we are we've gotten here and we are strong so it takes a strong person to go out there to ask for help and support i don't care even if you get on the phone go to a mental health professional and just vent get off your chest to someone who can't judge who won't judge you they're just there to listen they're not gonna they're not gonna be like a family member why you tell me this now i don't trust it's not gonna be any of that you can get it off your chest and process through things you still are strong if you seek sir if you seek help mm-hmm I like that. Mm -hmm. Suffer anxiety. And I'm on medication for it. Okay, good. Okay, so... So yeah, okay. So you're on med medication. You took the first step, and and I know a lot of people have issues with like medication. Like, what do I do? I don't want to take no medication. Um, like, it's nothing wrong with medication. Just have a plan in mind. It's the same way, and I know it's a lot of women on this platform. Same way when you're going to the doctor and you're about to have a baby, they're like, do you want the medication or you want to do a natural? And if, but if it gets to this point, we're gonna get you the medication. That's kind of how it is. A lot of women opt for natural, but when they get there, they're like, oh, you know what? I might need something, and mm -hmm. then it's not gonna like it has stay forever some diagnoses yes they may have to be medicated for their whole life but that's it's nothing wrong with that so with the medication it's an imbalance right so they address the is they have you know you know the serotonin to make you feel better with the depression so it's different things so say you're having an imbalance like something is off you take a medication it could kind of if your mind is racing the medication may slow it down just enough not slow you down physically where you won't notice just slow you not down enough to kind of get that clarity so you may not be impulsive so with um with um with the medications with the psychotropic medications oh yes they not any narcotics good but with the psychotropic medication like the you may hear of xanax or you may hear of um well butrin for depression or you may hear of different things that you may take um with the psychotropic medication it could kind of help calm I've, I've seen it do wonders for people and i've seen people like no i don't like it i just want to work on the skills but i like the medication and the therapy to go hand in hand because with anxiety a lot of times which anxiety is another warning trigger. You know what I'm saying? It goes in levels. So I want you guys to think of it like this. Um, with anxiety, sometimes we have 
smaller, small, like, like quick anxiety throughout the day that we get over really quickly. So like, for example, when I'm going to hop in my car and I'm going down the street, if I don't have my seatbelt on, I'm having low anxiety. I hurry up and put my seatbelt on. Now I could be either be thinking about the police officer or I either could be thinking about a crash. I want to be safe. So with that anxiety, what our mind does to kind of help us get over it, our mind takes us on a loop. So we have to process through sometimes with anxiety. So when we struggle from it, I get, this is a tip I give my clients What's the, okay, that I look at outcomes. What's the best outcome? Okay. What's the likely outcome? What's the best outcome and what's the worst outcome? What anxiety? And this is going real quick in your head. Like, you know, it may take time with some things, but sometimes it's going real fast. When I'm putting on my seatbelt in the car with the anxiety, I'm looking at, say I'm looking at accidents. So the best outcome would be I could get there safely without my seatbelt or not. That's the best. The 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 worst outcome could be I get in a car accident, I get ejected or I get whiplash, anything. I didn't have my seatbelt on, something could really go wrong. And the, um, but the likely outcome may be the same thing with the best is I get somewhere because I don't drive really fast you know so but I might get a ticket because the law is wearing seatbelt so I'm just gonna put on my seatbelt so that's the anxiety and then it'll it'll get rid of it at least in that moment when I'm going to that place now even when you do that you can also think would that matter if the worst outcome was to happen would it matter in a month would it matter in a year? Would it matter in five years? Or either you could do would it matter in a week? Would it matter in a month? Would it matter in a year? If the worst thing was to happen, the worst thing that happened is an accident. That might matter in a year, depending on it. So I'm putting my seatbelt on, you know, <laughs> get rid of that anxiety. And I'm putting my seatbelt on because that worst thing could happen. And that kind of helps you decide, make decisions when you're having anxiety. And it kind of helps you kind of overcome it when you think about those steps with the anxiety. And that works. That's like a self-talk strategy, coping skill strategy. Um, you know, I'm very CBT. My, my theoretical orientation is CBT, strength-based and solution, solution focus. In the moment, yes, I do explore trauma um, and we process through trauma, but we also work through like right now in the moment, solution focus. What do you want? What are your goals? So that way we can achieve them so we can overcome anxiety. So that's why that's a CBT. Um, in a moment, that thought process. So hopefully that helps with some strategies for anxiety and you could put whatever your scenario in, in there. But it was a long question. I didn't see. Okay. So I moved back to Indiana to care for my dad and mom passed. And mom, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Karen, mom passed and he's 79. He has been in the hospital and rehab. Now he's in a state where he's disoriented and delusional and I have to work to support us. I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Everyone keeps telling me to take care of myself. I honestly don't know how to do that. So, yes. So what you're going through right now is doo -doo 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 -doo, he's in the hospital. He's in the hospital and rehab. Now he's in the state where he's just disoriented. Kind of want to know, is he living with you? Does it say he lives with you? OK. And that's my question. OK. Everyone keeps telling you take care of yourself. So what you're going through right now is called like a caregiver fatigue and caregiver burnout. So that's why it's called caregiver compassion fatigue, caregiver fatigue, caregiver burnout. You have to take care of yourself. I know you don't know how to do it. Um, the first step, I don't know Indiana laws, is like a respite for your dad. If he's living with you, he has been in a hospital, re he's disoriented, delusional. So I would do a respite. And um, and when you're on respite, when he's on respite, and I don't know if he has the benefit, you got to kind of look through the area on aging out there, or I don't know if he's on a Medicaid where they may have um, a benefit. And they'll do like a five day or a weekend. A lot of time is covered. Um, and that's what I kind of assess for fi finances, um, you know, or kind of benefits because you may need a respite to kind of collect your thoughts. That's where you, but that's kind of collect your thoughts on what you need to do moving forward. Because if he's at a state, if something somewhere <laughs> societal, we got to take care of our parents. We got to take care of our parents. We got to be there for them. But a part of being there for them is to kind of assess within ourselves if we're able to, if we're capable of doing it. Because a lot of times we'll put a lot of that stress on us because we like, oh, they would have did it for us or they took good care of us. So we worry about having to have someone else take care of them. But I'm going to tell you this, and this is my experience. Like I told you, I worked hospice and home health. <laughs> so I worked hospice for four years. 
a lot of times the caregiver go first. And that's not to be rude. That's not to be anything. Caregivers, a lot of times they go first. And then what happens to the, the patients? We just, we transfer them over to an assisted living facility or a care facility or a group home that's, that do an amazing job taking care of them. And I sometimes sit back and think like, dang, if this, if this would have happened ahead of time, she would have been able to, the, the wife would have been able to make the doctor's appointments or the daughter would have been able to do what she needed to do for herself, but we didn't. So he does. Okay. So he does live with you. Look into a respite, like just in that way you could collect your dots and see what's next because the people bring, okay. Medical professionals and caregivers are there for a reason they're trained to do some of the things that we are not trained to do they are there to kind of understand some of the symptomology that goes along with the declining health and they can kind of be proactive in the care we can't we're usually reactive because we don't know so we're calling them when when we need help there's nothing wrong to kind of have them in a space you can go to different places look at them review them look for different things i always tell people when they're thinking about getting their parents cared for because they can't do it anymore or either getting respite just for a little bit so they can have that break for a little bit of time. You can go to the facilities, check them out. I always say, see if it smell like urine. I don't like the place to smell like urine. That's always a red flag for me. Look at the nurses and the people. Look at the look, look at the nurses. Talk to them. Are they smiley? Do they seem overworked? How about the members? You'll see a lot of the residents there in the halls. They're laughing. They're smiling. Or they look happy. They're saying, hey, that might be a nice place because it looks like they're being taken care of. Look at the activity list. See how it works. Look at this. Ask them how often they check on them. And then pop up at random times. You know what I'm saying? So you can kind of see what the day shift doing, night shift doing. And then that's how you can kind of just, and then pick two people who can always give you those updates, who get to know you, know you're involved. And they like, because if they know a family member is involved, they're not going to mess with, they're, they're not, they're going to do right. Cause I've been in places and I'm, you know, I, I tell my students when I'm with young kids, y'all ear hustling, you know, cause they always know what's going on. They don't know what's going on with their stuff, but they know what the staff doing. So I'm around and I'm listening and I hear like Mrs. Walter's daughter always here. Make sure she changed, make sure she got her because they know that Miss Walter's going to show up. And I said, I know that's right. So I always tell them to show up because you have, it's okay. So I want you to process that. Like, okay, is this something that I can do? as if he continues to decline because you want them to be safe it's about his safety first and are you the best person to keep him safe with with your abilities and your skill set and would you kind of feeling as though you're you're burning out and getting stressed so like I said first a break and then another part you may be going through what I tell people is anticipatory grieving so grief we think people gone you know, we like, oh, they're no longer here. We're going to go to the graveyard. Da, 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 da. But grief, anticipatory grief, it starts once we hear that person has an, has a has a diagnosis that, um, you know, that we know it's a chronic one that they're going to decline from there. And then one day they may um, decline and pass. And then they're no longer themselves. So we're grieving the loss of who we, who they were. We're grieving the loss of who, who you're grieving the loss of who your dad was with the declining health and the delusions. So it's still a grief. So you're still going through that anger, bargaining, you know, the different phases, the different stages of grief. So you're going through anticipatory grief and caregiver fatigue. So this is why you feel like, like, you can't take it anymore because you're not, you don't really have time to focus on yourself when you're dealing with a loved one who's going through a decline. So that's why I'm like that. Respite, see if it's some kind of respite services or some kind of custodial care. They may call it through Medicaid or through whatever his benefits are, or just kind of see what kind of the area on aging. I don't know. They call that that in Arizona, but they may call it like a senior helpline or something like that and call and see what kind of resources they have where they might have somebody come out to the house for you for free, or maybe you take them somewhere for a weekend so you could process next steps and then decide whether it may be appropriate for him to go into care and you assess the care. And it's, it's nothing wrong with that. And you still show up and you make the room his and you do everything you need to do. And, and then he may be a little more happy because they have activities and it's more active. And it's, it's not a, you know, it's not just at home and, and you, you, you struggling through things, but you have to get that self-care to kind of get your mind right so you can see what's next steps. So I would say seek like respite first, a good place. So that way you can kind of get your mind together. And it's nothing wrong if you decide on a facility. I don't know why people... Don't think that, but mm -hmm. okay, you're welcome. I'm glad I, I was able to help. 
Oh, that's <laughs> that's all right. Me too. She said, "Why? Well, I do cuss a little." Yes, yes, yes. So with the yeah, with the black psychiatrist, yes. Um, yeah, I've noticed that. Uh, it's hard. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find black uh, mental health professionals. Um, I have seen that be an issue a lot of time. I was the only one on my team. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, a lot of times I was the only one, uh, only black, um, provider on my team. So it's, it's tough because, um, even though like, you know, physically, a lot of us are the same culturally, we go through different things and systemically we're treated different. So if you guys are seeking mental health professionals, PCPs, different things like that, I really want you guys to go out and kind of look into their background because what I do is you're looking for people who are culturally responsive. I know the buzzword back in the day was culturally competent and it still is culturally competent is really good because you could kind of see what I, the, the, I, I, I say culturally responsive because to me, culturally competent did highlight the differences in the cultures. So, okay, Native don't like looking in the eye or Black people, you know, women led is very, you know, whatever. So when I got training, I'm like, yeah, no, it's a little, little, little different. You know what I'm saying? So, but it's good to know those foundational pieces, providers. <laughs> it's good for us to know those foundational pieces, but we also need to be culturally responsive. And culturally responsive is understanding the historical and systemic effects that each culture have went through in a society. Because, you know, Native have their own historical and system things against them. So does uh, Black community. So does Hispanic community. It's different how the ways we are treated. And then we kind of act differently. We move a little differently through society. So um, when someone says, oh, that's abuse, I'm like, oh, no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just her talking about her son. She really, pr she's proud of her son. And if you look into the post-traumatic slave syndrome, if you look into any research, research like that, like we used to do it and, and, you know, because we didn't want them being sold. So we'll say they're stupid and dumb, even though we're trying to keep them closer. So it's not that blatant, but it's still some things that have been handed down. Oh, they get on my nerves when we love the mess out of them. So you can't take that by word of mouth and I get that right you know so I get it you don't have to explain it to me but the to the common ear it sounds like oh my gosh like she's talking bad about no 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 and I have to like no I get what you're saying and then there's something about not having to share a story over and over again you don't have to tell me that oh my gosh I gotta do my daughter's hair tonight and I'm like what's her do she a, is she a 4c oh my gosh let's finish this session I know you got a lot you know so I don't have to <laughs> my clients appreciate that that I know it's a process but it's also bonding it's also that time together with your daughter and you can talk and kind of share stories and it's something it's a cultural practice that's really good that I remember that I you know used to hate but it's something that I it helped me bond closer with my mom and I do it the same with my daughters but I I get it's a process so I get it so um so yes so I wish it was more people so this I want to take this too you look for a black psychiatrist or or a Hispanic or whoever whatever's in your community but I always say I tell people not all skin folk can folk so I don't know if you mean we want to find providers who understand us intrinsically and understand the systemic effects that have on us because I got some colleagues who they can go toe to toe with some people and I'm like wow where you hear that from well like, they like girl let me tell you about how I was raised let me tell you where I come from and I said I would have never guessed that you like you know what I'm saying but it's right there they understand us and then you can always switch just because you go to someone you don't have to stay um, you don't have to stay. You can move on to the next person. The same thing, PCP, OB, whatever. Move on to the next person. Second and third opinion is no, it's just go out there and do that because you know your body, you know your situation, you know your families. I take my client's word for it and I say, okay, let's work through this because I'm not here to tell you what to do. We just help to kind of guide you. We're kind of working through the processes for you because this is your life you have to live. Your successes are defined by you with in your box in your circle so you know and make sure your providers know that as well mm -hmm. okay it says oh my god my aunt was not well and expected to pass with my cousin pa oh no yeah yeah going to funeral so sorry for your loss oh my gosh and was your cousin a caregiver man that's that's a tough one so th those multiple yeah griefs 
that is sad. Those multiple, those like lump, the, it's like, it's, it's one of those things that go on in family. I don't know if you, it's like your, my family, it happened in threes, but it's, it's so sad. So we have to, with grief, um, those rituals will matter. Um, when people pass, like people say the celebration of life, I love how people are now going through the celebration of life. This is, that's tough when the cousin and then now the aunt, that's tough. That's tough because now you got to do checkpoints to see how everyone's doing and then what's going to happen next from that point. Right. So now it's the checkpoints, like the ritual is going to need to change, but you guys, it's just, you have to acknowledge it. If it's anger, you feeling because of the grief, it's just anger address the anger, cope with the anger, you know, like with grief, I notice people don't, they just like, oh, he's grieving, but no, he could be stressed. He could be sad. They could be guilty. You got to address whatever that symptoms that associated with the grief too, and just understand it's normal. And you're going to go in and out of each of them. Mm -hmm. I live in Northern California. Oh man. Okay. No, I'm just thinking about that loss. I can't, you know, it's hard. It's tough time. I live in Northern California and I went to therapy once. I didn't feel comfortable because the psychiatrist was white and she was basically let me talk and not really say a word. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, North Carolina seemed like it would have a more diverse group of people. Um, so when you get people like that, and you know, I've gotten feedback before. Um, I've gotten feedback. Give them feedback. Tell them like, hey, you're not even talking. You just let me talk, not saying a word. I want some skills because you're going to get the clients who want to just talk. And you're going to get the clients who like, not nah, give me strategies. I want worksheets. I want homework. So I ask them. And like I said, I'm solution focused. So I tell my clients right away, I give worksheets. <laughs> I give strategies. You don't have to do them. We could go over them in the next session, but these are aids and tips. We're going to work on some kind of skill. Now, if they have a loss or something like that, I'm going to let them talk process. We may not work on anything, but just to get it off their chest, but you can tell them. Like, hey, yeah, I want worksheets, you know, and it may be just a disconnect. They don't know what to say. And that's when you go start searching for another therapist. But you could let them know. I had a lady who I remember I had a client and they were I was working on something and she was like, I want to work on my anxiety. And um, I said something different. <laughs> in her, but she was thinking it was anxiety. I didn't see anxiety. So she told me like, we just talking about such and such and such. And then we was talking about what I assessed, but I was like, you know what? You are right. You do want to work on anxiety. So let's get it. And then I just started pulling on my anxiety tips. And then at the end of all that, it ended up being what I originally had assessed, but it was one of my seniors. Sometimes my seniors, I have to just listen sometimes and just hear what they got to say because they like, I live this life. So, you know, so, but, but it's okay. You can, you can do that. And then sometimes it may not just be black. It could be Hispanic. I had a young, I had a lady from India um, and, um, she said, I just asked for somebody racially and ethnically diverse. Cause I figured I may not find anyone from there, but I knew I would someone who was more racially, eth ethnically diverse. They may understand my story a little better. And I was like, Oh, that's smart. I'm gonna write that down. So maybe if it's white and you, they may not be getting you sometimes going in saying up front, like I want someone black, uh, or African-American or I want someone Hispanic, um, they, they do Hispanic a little better because of language, but just be like, I want somebody Hispanic or black, or I just want someone racially, ethnically diverse. And sometimes they may have someone on the team and you could ask up front before they assign you. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that helps. Oh yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So hopefully that helps in your, your situation and moving on to the next person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know who said that, but thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 who wants to who wants to cold switch during counseling <laughs> she said who wants to cold switch during exactly yeah yeah i have mm -hmm. to i have to do that yeah i have to do that sometimes and but myself always comes out it, it does and 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 typically it's like man i never had my last counselor wasn't like you i was like because i couldn't hold on long enough i'm thinking to myself <laughs> but yeah you're right Michelle, do you want a room? Oh, Michelle, that was great. Do you have a room to make a prayer closet? I recently did this and I love it. Yes, I love the prayer closet. Wow. You know what? Um, 
I tell people, um, do you have room to make a prayer closet? I tell people, even with the prayer closet, it could be a closet. Because I remember the room. What was it? War room? What was that movie? Yeah. Yeah. War, war room. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I said, mm-hmm. even if it's not a closet, even if it's a corner of your house, even this is just mm-hmm. a simple wall, put it on your refrigerator. Like yeah. I tell them to put it wherever they need to put it. And then I'm going to add to it. You got that prayer closet or I got some people who are little who on a verge like like. Like they 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 ride the fence of, of spirituality. They don't know I was raised like this, but I don't know because this and that happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, okay. Well, I tell them to have a little corner with their affirmations. So if you're mm-hmm. not spiritual, and you know, um, because I got my <laughs> I got <laughs> I got my scriptures up, um, just about everywhere in the house. So I tell them to have their affirmations. Um, a closet with affirmations or um, with the young kids who may not have, they're building up that self-worth. I tell them do a corner of their room with like their soft toys, their plushies, like have a corner instead of getting in that bed, sleeping all the time, going to a deeper depression. I say, get go in the corner and make that light it up. Put your LED mm-hmm. lights, put your little plushy furry pillows, your dolls, your, your whatever, just your, your, your journals, like have that area for you. That's your self-care area mm-hmm yeah stack trauma mm. yes yeah, stack trauma yes yes so have those areas because and that works for kids too if you want if they like they sleep and i think they depressed tell them get that area over there but i love that what was the one right before that one oh i think she was i think she was oh yeah oh yeah, yeah thank you no no problem you're welcome yes so do we have any more questions Love you are the bomb.com, honey. I, I really appreciate you coming on and educating us because a lot of women, especially black women and black mm-hmm. people, we don't, we don't go to therapy, you no. know. I mean, <laughs> and I'm glad that I started going therapy because I, you mm-hmm. know, I have things that I have to unpack and mm-hmm. I want to be a better person, um, every day, and so, yes. um, some past trauma things that trigger you and you know that mm-hmm. you probably have went through and you don't mm-hmm. know it's a trigger or you know it's a trigger but it trigger you but no somebody else might not know it's a trigger or exactly you going crazy in the grocery store and nobody knows like what's nobody going knows. on so we have to always um you know dive deeper and it's mm-hmm. I, I, I love therapy now that i yeah. start going I know mm-hmm. I'm on my healing journey, I, and it is working for it me. It is healing. You know what I'm saying for me, though. You know? Good. And it, yeah. it is a healing journey. And we do have to you know, start normalizing the discussion so that way people can start talking about it. And, and that way, you know, it'll help others identify you know, how to help. So we have to start normalizing the discussion. So, and that's what, you know, that's what we need to do with each other, start uplifting our communities because we do go through a lot and it's hard to talk about. And we've been secretive for so long, but I think what it is, is our, our, we had to be raised strong. We had to, because they knew that society was going to hit us upside of our head. So they wanted us to kind of go through it, but it (laughs) would have been more helpful to kind of be able to talk through it and cope through it and know we have that community to reach out to who will understand who will understand it and not just push it to a side to the side yes. so that's why we want to continue to be there for each other and let, seek those therapists because I've done that I've had therapy for myself as well and I was like doing my own strategies and they were not like you you working it out like I know I just needed to vent you know <laughs> so yes. but I mean it was helpful at that time so you know yes. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, mm-hmm. well, you touched on a whole lot, mm-hmm. and I would love to have you back again. Oh, yeah. okay? Yes, yeah. and and I also want you to um, let people know where they can reach you and okay. all that information. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if you guys want to look at more information, um, my, uh, oh, I'm not that good with social media stuff, but, uh, my uh, private practice name is, um, discovering the bigger picture. Um, you guys can reach me at bigger picture. So www.biggerpictureaz.com. And um, that's my website. You can always shoot a message if you're in the Arizona area and you're looking for um, therapy. It's 100% virtual services. And I um, 
Um, I have uh, culturally responsive counselors, all that. We even do gaming therapy for the youth or young adults who, who are difficult to engage and they want a different kind of platform. So biggerpictureaz.com and um, also discovering a bigger picture there Facebook. Um, that's my business and Lovely Pool on LinkedIn, Lovely Pool LMSW on LinkedIn. So I think those are all my socials that I use. Um, Ebony House in Arizona, like, I mean, you know, and Beautiful Beginnings. Um, I'm sorry, Beautiful Pathways um, is another place that I partner with out in Arizona that you can find me. And they have an actual in-person clinic um, in Arizona if you want some in-person therapy. Mm hmm. Yeah, someone just asked, are you available? So yeah. we're going to also get your information. I'm going to get all her information, you guys, yeah. and put it in the communities so you can reach out to her. Mm -hmm. um, she is awesome. Okay. Yes. Available. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. I would love for you to come. I, you know, I love helping people, helping them heal. Can you, can you, can you, in, what they say? Oh, yeah. I don't understand the question. Can you and them? Oh, I don't know what they were saying. Well, who was that that said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so any last words, uh, Lovely Pool, before we let you go? No, I'm just going to say thank you to you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I was a little nervous, but once we got into it, I was like, oh, okay. It's not that bad, but I appreciate I appreciate you thinking about me and let me be on your platform. And uh, everyone, um, any you know, thank you for sharing your stories with me. And I'm hoping I answered them. And you know, I appreciate you guys giving me your time. Uh, oh, okay. She said, "Can you uh, pin that in the chat?" Okay, yes. I'm going to make sure that we get all her information for you all, mm -hmm. and I will pin the details. She was in the details. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> said, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, she. You guys, she is the bomb.com. Um, she also um, was one of my speakers for the Gems and Jewels um, We Stay as Conference in 2022. Uh, 20, uh, so she, I mean, she's the bomb, okay? And she was the last speaker, and everyone <laughs> loved her, okay? So um, I know that it was Mental Health Awareness Month, and I wanted to bring her on. You know, I know we talk about wigs, hair, and beauty. But at the end of the day, you guys, I'm going to also tap into things that I feel like is very important. And your mental health is important because when you look good, you feel good, right? So, yeah. So <laughs> that's why I brought her on. Um, I will give you all her information. You can also have this, this live will be up for a replay. If there's something that resonated with you and you want to go back over some of the things that she said because she gave out a lot of good information. Please make sure that you replay and save this video, okay? And make sure you share this video, like this video, because somebody else might be struggling, going through some things, and this is what we are here for. This is what Lovely Pool does for a living. So, yes, and like I said, I'm going to tap in, get all her information for you all. Thank you so much again, Lovely, for coming on. I am super excited, and thank you for blessing my platform because it's women like you that help me to make sure that we get the word out for the things that need to be done. You know what I'm saying? Because like I said, mental health is very important. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. God be the glory. Yes, yes. It is very important. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So you guys, we're going to end this live. Thank y'all so much for coming on. Um, I love you all. I'll see you guys this week in the communities. Have a great Sunday and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.